such as that experienced by people who are persecuted. 8. Autosuggestion. 9. Fear. 10. Alcohol and drugs. The desire for sexual expression comes at the head of the list of stimuli that step up the mind and start the wheels of physical action. The emotions associated with a human sexual drive bring into being a state of mind. When motivated by this desire, people often show courage, willpower, persistence, imagination, and creative ability that they don't normally have. So strong and impelling is the desire for sexual expression that people freely run the risk of life and reputation because of it. A river may be dammed and its water controlled for a time, but eventually it will force an outlet. The same is true of the emotions related to sexual expression. It may be submerged and controlled for a time, but its very nature causes it to be ever-seeking means of expression. The desire for sexual expression is inborn and natural. The desire cannot and should not be submerged or eliminated, but it can be given other outlets that enrich the body, mind, and spirit. When harnessed and redirected, this motivating force has been used as a powerful creative force in literature, art, and other pursuits, including the accumulation of riches. A teacher who has trained more than 30,000 salespeople came to the conclusion that individuals who are most confident sexually are the most efficient salespeople. The explanation is that the factor of personality known as personal magnetism is a manifestation of sexual energy. Editor's Comments There have been numerous psychological and sociological studies about the relationship between sexuality and success that tend to support Hill's observation. Because physical characteristics are the most quantifiable aspects of sexuality, most research studies focus on gender, attractiveness, body size, and age, and they measure indicators such as first impressions, expectation of performance, perception of performance, and social interaction. These studies generally conclude that when comparing individuals of equal competence, for men, the perception is that taller men will do better than short, a full head of hair will outperform balding, handsome or virile will beat out plain or older. For women, the results are comparable. The perception is that attractive performs better than plain, slim or shapely scores higher than overweight, younger is expected to be superior to older. These observations about physical sexuality may seem obvious, but they lead to a conclusion that is very significant. Obviously, not all people who succeed are tall and virile or attractive and shapely. It is also a fact that the success of those who are short, balding, plump, or plain isn't always due to superior skill or luck. Clearly, there is another kind of attractiveness that often supersedes physical appeal. This other kind of attractiveness is connected to human sexuality, but it is not what would usually be referred to as sexy. People who have this quality are often said to have chemistry, personality, charm, or appeal. Hill called this kind of attraction personal magnetism. Today, the more common term is charisma. This is the end of the editor's comments. When employing salespeople, a good sales manager looks for personal magnetism or charisma as the first requirement. People who lack this kind of sexual energy will never become enthusiastic nor inspire others with enthusiasm. And enthusiasm is one of the most important requisites in salesmanship, no matter what you're selling. The public speaker, preacher, lawyer, or salesperson who is lacking in charisma is a flop as far as being able to influence others is concerned. That, plus the fact that most people are influenced through an appeal to their emotions, should easily convince you of the importance of charisma as a part of the salesperson's ability. Master salespeople attain mastery in selling because they either consciously or unconsciously transmute charisma, sexual energy, into sales enthusiasm. That statement explains the actual, practical meaning of sexual transmutation. The meaning of the word transmute is, in simple language, 
the changing or transferring of one element or form of energy into another. The transmutation of sexual energy means switching the mind from thoughts of physical expression to thoughts of some other nature. Salespeople who know how to turn on charisma have acquired the art of sexual transmutation, whether they know it or not. The majority of salespeople who transmute their sexual energy do so without being aware of what they are doing or how they are doing it. You can cultivate and develop this quality in your dealings with others. Through cultivation and understanding, this vital motivating force may be drawn upon and used to great advantage in relationships between people. This energy may be communicated to others in the following ways. The Handshake The touch of the hand indicates instantly the presence of charisma or the lack of it. The Tone of Voice Charisma, or sexual energy, is the factor with which the voice may be colored or made musical and charming. Posture and carriage of the body. People with charisma and with grace and ease. The vibrations of thought. People with charisma project sexuality through their personality in a way that influences those around them. Clothing and style. People who are charismatic are usually very careful about their personal appearance. They usually select clothing of a style becoming to their personality, physique, complexion, etc. Editor's Comments Having established a link between sexuality and success in the form of charisma, in the following section, Napoleon Hill explores how sexuality might also be a motivating factor in success by enhancing creativity. To illustrate the connection, Hill draws upon the biographies of historical figures who exhibited both charisma and exceptional creativity. In the time since Hill conducted his research, many women have risen to positions of power and influence. Their accomplishments have been well documented and are readily available in bookstores and libraries. However, when Hill was assembling his data, the majority of historical biographies available were about successful men. Further, the successful industrialists and political leaders he had personally studied during the previous 30 years were also men. Because of this limitation, Hill does not theorize about the role men might play in motivating the success of women. This issue is addressed in a later editorial comment. This is the end of the editor's comments. Creativity it seemed quite significant to me when I made the discovery that practically every great leader I had the privilege of analyzing was a man whose achievements were largely inspired by a woman. In most instances, the woman was a wife, of whom the public had heard little or nothing. In a few of the cases I studied, the source of inspiration was the other woman. The pages of history are filled with the records of great men whose achievements may be traced directly to the influence of women who aroused the creative faculties of their minds. Napoleon Bonaparte was one of these. When inspired by his first wife, Josephine, he was irresistible and invincible. When his better judgment or reasoning faculty prompted him to put Josephine aside, he began to decline. His defeat and exile to St. Helena were not far distant. Abraham Lincoln was a notable example of a great leader who achieved his greatness through the discovery and use of his faculty of creative imagination. It is noted in practically every book written about Lincoln that he discovered and began to use this faculty as the result of the love that he experienced when he met Anne Rutledge. This is more than an interesting historical fact. It is of significance in connection with the role sexuality plays in the study of the source of genius. Following is a list of famous men of outstanding achievement. George Washington, Napoleon Bonaparte, William Shakespeare, Abraham Lincoln, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Robert Burns, Thomas Jefferson, Albert Hubbard, Albert H. Gary, Woodrow Wilson, John H. Patterson, Andrew Jackson, Enrico Caruso. Wherever there was evidence available in connection with the lives of these men of achievement, it indicated most convincingly 
that each possessed a highly developed sexual nature. An analysis of the information taken from biographies and historical writings leads to the following conclusions. 1. Those of greatest achievement have a highly developed sexual nature but have learned the art of transmutation of sexual energy. 2. Those who have accumulated great fortunes and achieved outstanding recognition in literature, art, industry, architecture, and the professions were motivated by the influence of a mate or lover. When driven by these emotions, people become gifted with a superpower for action. If you understand this, you will also understand that sexual transmutation contains the secret of creative ability. Editor's Comments As noted previously, although Hill's analysis focused on men, today there is a wide range of biographies about women who have succeeded in every aspect of life, including business, politics, religion, sports, entertainment, and the arts. Bearing in mind that biographical information is always subjective, the reader can now find ample material from which to draw a conclusion as to whether Hill's theory about sexuality as a motivating force is equally evident in women. Napoleon Hill had to do an in-depth analysis of biographies in searching for indications that the subject's sexuality had a correlation to their success. Today, we just turn on the television and we're inundated with intimate details about both men and women suggesting that the best and the brightest are apparently also the sexiest. Although scandals aren't usually cited as scientific proof, the exposés of some of the biggest entertainment and sports stars, high-profile CEOs of major companies, numerous politicians, and even a few presidents, all make at least a common-sense case for Hill's theory about the correlation between sexuality and success. This is the end of the editor's comments. Obviously, this does not mean that everyone who is highly sexed is a genius. People attain the status of a genius only when and if they stimulate their minds so that they can draw upon the forces available through the creative faculty of the imagination. Although it is the most important of the stimuli or motivators, the mere possession of sexual energy is not sufficient to produce a genius. The energy must be transmuted from desire for physical contact into some other form of desire and action before it will lift one to the status of a genius. Genius and Creative Imagination A definition of genius might be someone who has discovered how to increase the intensity of thought to the point where that person can freely communicate with sources of knowledge not available through the ordinary rate of thought. This definition should prompt some questions in the mind of anyone reading this book. The first question should be, how may one communicate with sources of knowledge that are not available through ordinary thought? The next question should be, are there known sources of knowledge that are available only to geniuses, and if so, what are these sources and exactly how may they be reached? In the following, I will offer methods so that you can experiment and prove to yourself that this is true. By doing so, you will have the answer to both questions. Editor's Comment Humans perceive things through the five senses of sight, smell, taste, hearing, and touch. Another kind of perception, as when you have a feeling about something, was discussed in the chapters on desire, faith, and autosuggestion. This kind of perception is often referred to as the sixth sense, and in the following, Hill explores the relationship between sexuality, motivation, creative imagination, and the sixth sense. This is the end of the editor's comment. The reality of a sixth sense has been fairly well established. This sixth sense is creative imagination. The faculty of creative imagination is something the majority of people never use during an entire lifetime. And if they do use it, it usually happens by mere accident. Only a small number of people deliberately use their creative imagination for a specific purpose. Those who do use this faculty voluntarily and with understanding of its functions are geniuses.
Creative imagination is the direct link between your finite mind and what I have termed infinite intelligence. All revelations and all discoveries of basic or new principles in the field of invention take place through the faculty of creative imagination. When ideas, concepts, or hunches flash into your mind, they can only have come from one or more of the following sources. 1. From the mind of some other person who has just released the thought, idea, or concept through conscious thought. 2. Your subconscious mind, which stores every thought and impression that ever reached your brain through any of the five senses. 3. From another person's subconscious storehouse. 4. Infinite intelligence. There are no other possible sources from which inspired ideas or hunches may be received. When brain action has been stimulated through one or more of the ten mind stimulants listed at the beginning of this chapter, it has the effect of lifting you far above the horizon of ordinary thought. It permits you to envision distance, scope, and quality of thoughts not available on the lower plane, such as when you are solving routine problems of business. When you are lifted to a higher level of thought through mind stimulation, it is as though you have taken off in an airplane. You can now see over and beyond the horizon that limits your vision when you are on the ground. Not only that, but while you are on this higher level of thought, you are not even aware of such things as the problems of gaining the three basic necessities of food, clothing, and shelter. You are in a world of thought in which the ordinary workaday thoughts have been removed, just as the hills and valleys that obstruct your vision on the ground don't interfere when you are in an airplane. While on this exalted plane of thought, the creative faculty of the mind is given freedom for action. The way has been cleared for the sixth sense to function. It becomes receptive to ideas that could not reach the individual under any other circumstances. The sixth sense is the faculty that marks the difference between a genius and an ordinary individual. Developing your creative imagination. A mind stimulant is any influence that will either temporarily or permanently increase the intensity of thought. The previously mentioned ten major stimulants are those most commonly resorted to. Through these sources you may commune with infinite intelligence, enter the storehouse of your subconscious mind, or perhaps even that of another person. That is all there is to genius. The more you use your creative faculty, the more alert and receptive it becomes to factors originating outside your conscious mind. And the more this creative faculty is used, the more you will rely upon it for your thoughts and ideas. This faculty can be cultivated and developed only through use. What we generally refer to as our conscience operates entirely through the faculty of the sixth sense. The great artists, writers, musicians, and poets become great because they acquire the habit of relying upon the still small voice that speaks from within through their creative imagination. Anyone with a keen imagination knows that some of their best ideas come through so-called hunches. One of the best-known public speakers admits that his speeches are only really great when he closes his eyes and begins to rely entirely upon the faculty of creative imagination. When asked why he closed his eyes just before the climax of his speech, he replied, I do it because then I speak through ideas that come to me from within. One of America's most successful and best-known financiers has the habit of closing his eyes for two or three minutes before making a decision. When asked why, he replied, With my eyes closed, I am able to draw upon a source of superior intelligence. Dr. Elmer R. Gates created more than 200 useful patents through the process of cultivating and using his creative faculty. His method is significant to anyone interested in attaining to the status of genius. Dr. Gates was one of the really great, though less publicized, scientists of the world. In his laboratory, he had what he called his personal communication room. It was practically soundproof, and all light could be shut out. 
It had a small table on which he kept a pad of writing paper. In front of the table, on the wall, was a light switch. When Dr. Gates desired to draw upon the forces available to him through his creative imagination, he would go into this room, seat himself at the table, shut off the lights, and concentrate on the known factors of the invention he was working on. He would stay in that position until ideas began to flash into his mind in connection with the unknown factors of the invention. On one occasion, ideas came through so fast that he was forced to write for almost three hours. When the thoughts stopped flowing, he examined his notes and found they contained a minute description of principles that had no parallel in the known data of the scientific world. Moreover, the answer to his problem was right there in those notes. Dr. Gates earned his living by sitting for ideas. He did it for individuals and corporations, and some of the most sensible people and largest traditional corporations in America paid him to do it. The part of your mind that you generally use for reasoning may be faulty, because it is largely guided by your accumulated experience. Not all knowledge that you have learned through experience is accurate. Many times your creative ideas are much more reliable because they come from sources that are more reliable than those available to the reasoning faculty of the mind. Methods used by geniuses are available to you. The major difference between the genius and the ordinary inventor is that the genius makes use of both the synthesized and the creative faculties of imagination. For example, the scientific inventor begins an invention by organizing and combining the known ideas or principles accumulated through experience through the synthesized faculty, the reasoning faculty. If the inventor finds this accumulated knowledge is insufficient, the scientist then draws upon the sources of knowledge available through the creative faculty. The method by which the inventor does this varies with the individual, but this is the essence of the procedure. 1. The inventor stimulates his or her mind so that it functions on a higher-than-average plane through one or more of the mind stimulants. 2. The inventor then concentrates on the known factors, the finished part of the invention, and creates in his or her mind a perfect picture of the unknown factors, the unfinished part of the invention. The inventor holds this picture in mind until it has been taken over by the subconscious, then relaxes by clearing his or her mind of all thought and waits for the answer to flash into mind. Sometimes the results are both definite and immediate. At other times the results are negative, depending on the state of development of the sixth sense or creative faculty. Thomas Edison tried out more than 10,000 different combinations of ideas through the synthetic faculty of his imagination, before he tuned in through the creative faculty and got the answer that perfected the incandescent light bulb. His experience was similar when he produced the phonograph. Editor's Comments Synchronicity, precognition, intuition, flashes of insight, hunches, gut feelings, symbolic dreams. These are all aspects of the phenomenon Napoleon Hill was describing in his two correlated terms, creative imagination and infinite intelligence. And the fact that Hill made a serious study of this function of the mind puts him in exceptional company. The fathers of modern psychology, Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung, recognized and tried to explain this sixth sense. Jung's concept of the collective unconscious which is the very basis of Jungian psychology, is in many ways identical to Hill's concept of infinite intelligence. Scientists from Archimedes to Newton to Einstein to the team of Watson and Crick, who determined the structure of DNA, all conceded that intuition was instrumental in their discoveries. Duke University created a department for the sole purpose of studying these phenomena under scientific conditions. Many scientists admit to using personalized techniques similar to Hill's method for accessing intuition and creativity. These include Friedrich Kekulé, who discovered the molecular structure of benzene through a dream symbol. 
physiologist Otto Luvi, who had a hunch followed by a dream that won him the Nobel Prize in Medicine. And as mentioned above, James Watson's breakthrough in the structure of DNA. Mozart, Shelley, Coleridge, Huxley, Descartes, Robert Louis Stevenson all claimed intuition played a role in their creations. William Blake learned the secret to a copper engraving process from a dream. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill firmly believed a premonition saved him from being killed by a bomb during the Blitz of London. As was noted earlier, psychiatry, clinical hypnosis, and affirmations all had to overcome considerable skepticism before they were accepted. That is also true of those phenomena Hill terms infinite intelligence. However, in the 1970s and 80s, the public's interest was piqued by well-researched books such as The Intuitive Edge by Philip Goldberg, Creative Dreaming by Patricia Garfield, and The Right Brain Experience by Mary Lee Zdenek. Though these anomalies of the mind still defy laboratory proof, contemporary researchers continue to publish tantalizing results. This is the end of the editorial comments. Nature has equipped the human brain and mind with internal stimulants that safely trigger the mind to tune in to fine and rare thoughts. No satisfactory substitute for nature's stimulants has ever been found. However, History is not lacking in examples of people who rose to the status of genius as the result of using artificial mind stimulants. Edgar Allan Poe wrote The Raven while under the influence of alcohol, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. Samuel Taylor Coleridge wrote Kubla Khan during an opium-induced dream, and Robert Burns wrote best when intoxicated. For Auld Lang Syne, my dear... We'll take a cup of kindness yet for Auld Lang Syne. It is true that these and others who are known as geniuses relied upon artificial mind stimulation. But a more important lesson to remember is how many of these people destroyed themselves through the use of those stimulants. Editor's Comments In more contemporary terms, Hill's point about the dangers of artificial mind stimulants was never better made than it was in the television series Behind the Music, which began running on VH1 in the late 1990s. The series was meant to chronicle the lives of rock stars and celebrate their hits. But after viewing two or three of the shows, they all began to look the same. Young singer and band have a hit record, make millions of dollars, plunge into the sex, drugs, and rock and roll lifestyle, everyone gets addicted, and they blow all of the money. By the end of the show, at least one band member overdoses, the band breaks up, the singer hits the skids, meets someone who inspires him or her to go into rehab, the ex-star makes an anti-drug TV spot and professes newfound faith and family values while announcing a comeback tour. Although the shows played like a bad parody of themselves, the fact that the stories were so similar that so many talented singers and songwriters who depended on drugs ended up burning out should be telling you something. Especially if you don't just want to succeed, but want to keep and enjoy your success. This is the end of the editor's comments. Every intelligent person knows that stimulation in excess through alcohol or drugs is a destructive form of intemperance. For some, Overindulgence in sexual expression may become just as destructive. A sexually obsessed person is not essentially different from a person addicted to drugs or alcohol. Both have lost control over their faculties of reason and willpower. Human sexuality is a mighty urge to action, but its forces are like a cyclone, almost impossible to completely control. When an individual is driven solely by emotions related to sexuality, that person may be capable of great achievement, but their actions are often disorganized and destructive. It is true that a person may pursue financial or business success by harnessing the driving force of sexual energy without self-control. But history is filled with evidence that such people likely have certain traits of character that rob them of the ability to either hold or enjoy their fortunes. Ignorance of this potential pitfall 
has cost thousands of people their happiness, even though they possessed riches. From my analysis of over 25,000 people, I found that those who succeed in an outstanding way often do not hit their stride until they are beyond the age of 40 or 50. This fact was so astounding that it prompted me to go into the study of its cause most carefully. My investigation disclosed that the major reason why many people do not succeed early in life is their tendency to dissipate their energies through overindulgence. The majority of people never learn that sexual energy has possibilities other than physical expression. And many of those who make this discovery only do so after having wasted many years during the time when their sexual energy was at its height. Most people come to the realization by accident, and many don't even know they have tapped into this power.